Welcome and thank you for uh, attending uh, the Ruby on Rails track when at J uh, Connect JS. Um, my name is Luigi. I'm the founding engineer at Upworthy. Um, I live here in Atlanta. I also uh, I also co-organize the Code for Atlanta Brigade. It's a Code for America Brigade. So if y'all are local. Do, do see our meetup uh, on uh, do see our meetup group on meetup.com, and uh, you can see us there at Code for Atlanta. And we do things like apply technically minded skill our, our technically minded skills to social good projects and civic good projects. So it's a real, really, really cool time. The next uh, event is in the Atlanta Tech Village in Buckhead. So uh, about Upworthy, the, the the focus of this talk. Um, the, the first thing, if, if you're not familiar with Upworthy, is to kind of know our overall mission as a media company. Uh, we're about four years old, and uh, our mission is to drive massive amounts of attention to the most important stories in the world. So that translates into content like this. This is a screenshot from our website yesterday. You see uh, the top story is really not necessarily about celebrity gossip, but actually about uh, it's kind of substance abuse and, and serious issues like that. There's uh, a story about uh, sharks, uh, killing sharks for their fins. Uh, there's a story about gender equality. There's another story here about mental health. So we do cover kind of substantive things, but we do try to make it go viral. And you've probably seen us on Facebook if you're, if you're familiar with Upworthy. So from the technical standpoint, when we say we want to drive massive amounts of attention, we really mean massive amounts of traffic. So that's a lot of what this talk is about, is scaling a website uh, in the face of uh, large traffic spikes. So here's a graph of our first two years of growth. Uh, we're, like I said, about a four-year-old company now. So um, this is a bit older, but you could see our chart of growth there. Uh, this is in Uniques, which is kind of what media companies measure themselves by. But in terms of page views, which is kind of the technical aspect, uh, we kind of, we grew. So we launched in early 2012. So April 2012 was the first month, uh, we first full month we were launched. And in April 2012, we had 1.7 million page views. So that's already kind of a, a lot of page views. And we've grown since then. So for example, last month in September, we had about 40 million page views last month. And we've served uh, 2.6 billion page views uh, all time uh, in the just under four years that we've been around. So what does our traffic look like? So this is uh, kind of a graph of uh, 24 hours. And you see, because we are a viral site, because we're a site that uh, kind of focuses on getting our stories out there on social media like Facebook, we have very spiky traffic. So Whereas maybe if you're, you're doing a site, you kind of see how traffic goes from uh, high to low during the workday or something like that. Our traffic is really very spiky based on what content is going viral at any time. So you he see here in, in from midnight to midnight, there's some spikes. And even uh, on this day, it was kind of late in the day, uh, Eastern time, around 7 PM when there was that, the largest spike. This means also that we have to account for large amounts of traffic at any one time. This is kind of one of the highest uh, concurrent. So this is a screenshot from Google Analytics real time, which tells you how many people are on your site at any given time. And so this is uh, one of the highest one. We have over 130,000 people on our site uh, at that time. And it was just kind of like that all day. So that's really the topic of this talk, which is how did we kind of manage the growth of our startup's web app in the face of very high traffic? And uh, this is something that before I joined Upworthy, I never thought I would have to deal with. I, I thought that that uh, high traffic stuff happened to other people that I would kind of sit in conferences, uh, conference talks of, and, and it happened to them. It wouldn't happen to the team I was on. But it really can happen, especially in in the days of uh, social media and the, the ability for kind of anything, any web thing to go viral, uh, there are many instances where things essentially blow up in traffic and, and you'll have to deal with it. So in the beginning, uh, we started in uh, 
actually January of 2012, that was when we launched, started the company. Um, and then a few months later, in late March, we launched. Um, so I was the founding engineer, or I am the founding engineer. I wrote the first lines of code. I, uh, I, wrote, I deployed the launch when we launched a few, uh, two months later. So the team at this time was just me as an engineer, and then we had a CTO who, because we were a small startup, we were, uh, he, was also, he was also coding. So um, we made the decision, or I, I kind of drove this decision to use Padrino. Who here has heard of Padrino? Cool. Uh, who here has heard of Sinatra? I would, I would assume so. So essentially, Padrino calls itself the Elegant Ruby Web Framework. It is really uh, somewhere in between Sinatra and Rails. So if you like Sinatra, but you need a little more of the stuff that Rails gets you, you can use uh, you can check out Padrino. Um, it also stole some really uh, great ideas from Django, the Python web framework. Uh, some of those ideas, the first was that you could have mountable apps uh, as a as part of a larger project. So instead of one large maybe Rails app as you're used to, you could have several smaller apps that were mounted inside a container app. And I'll show you what that means in a bit. It was very middleware-centric, being based on Sinatra, being based on Rack, which is Ruby's low-level web server frame, uh, sub web server library. A lot of it was about building middleware to, to accomplish various things. And from just a pure productivity standpoint, much like Django, it did have a built-in admin area. So slash admin on any app uh, was actually its own uh, Padrino uh, mountable app that you could get for free. And this was actually a time when Rails admin wasn't too mature yet. Um, so that was actually something really uh, appealing for us. So uh, I have talked to folks about this in the past and they are surprised that, that we chose to use Padrino in the beginning. And it was about this, and the reason why is at this point in my career is, is when I realized something um, after, after doing Rails for maybe five years or so, how, how, maybe six years, that the reality is no matter what framework you're using, um, all the web frameworks out there, if they're Ruby-based, if they're Node, if they're Python, they actually just exist to emit things to the browser, right? They emit HTML, CSS, probably JSON, JavaScript. While uh, Rails kind of gives you the full foundation of how to build web apps. Padrino lets you also choose how you construct things and how you, uh, how you serve the resources to the web browsers. And in this way, it's, it's about getting to know HTTP as a protocol. Um, the built-in properties and features, the, the headers, uh, the caching, um, the browser doesn't really care if you're running Rails or Django or Node on the back end. Uh, it really just cares about what the HTTP requests are, are coming back and forth. So there are some good parts about Padrino. Um, it was just Ruby, so if you're into Ruby, it's great. Um, it's just Rack. It's, it's built on, on top of Rack and Sinatra. There's much less magic than Rails. So if you have been using Rails and you've kind of scratched your head sometimes about how certain things happen and, and it's given you problems because you actually can't trace what exactly is going on in your app, that's good, that, that happens because of Rails' uh, uh, commitment, I guess, to doing things quickly for you without really exposing um, as much of the stuff underneath as maybe it should. Unlike Rails, Padrino is pretty unopinionated, so it is great if you have opinions. So if you, it's easy to plug in your, not only to use your database of choice, but to use your uh, ORM, your object relational mapper of choice, to use your templating language of choice, it's, uh, to use your, your JavaScript framework of choice. It's all easy to do that in, in Padrino. Uh, thinking about writing your app as middleware and different pieces of middleware is actually a really cool way to think about web apps. It helps you uh, really understand the, the HTTP protocol and the way that um, requests come in, responses come back out from your app, 
and really lets you have a, a very kind of clear vision of what exactly your web app is doing at any given time for any given request. And it's also quite light, performant, it's not, doesn't have a lot of stuff like Rails can have. So here was our architecture on Padrino. So we had this container app, uh, which was just a, a single project. And then in it was each sub app. So there, we had an app called Main, which is our public website. So when someone visited www.upworthy.com, this was that app. And then we had an admin area, which is essentially our CMS for our writers. And they would log into that and write their, their articles on Upworthy and post it. And we had some tools for them, some custom tools for them. In the middle, we had something we called a publisher. Um, and this was a kind of idea from the very old days of the web when movable type uh, was popular. So movable type is kind of an old school CMS that was popular maybe 10, 15 years ago. And the thing about, um, it's, it's essentially a, a, like, like WordPress is now. The thing about mo movable type is when you had a movable type website, even back then, it really could handle any sort of traffic uh, because it was a completely cached uh, system. So well, what movable type would do is when you, let's say, updated your article on your website, uh, it would save it to the database. And then when it saved it to the database, it would completely write the HTML for, for that page uh, onto disk. And serving HTML files or any static files from disk is always going to be much more performant than serving something from a, a live web app that has to take in uh, uh, has to make a database request, has to build objects, like has to build Ruby objects. That takes time in memory, uh, takes time in CPU. Whereas if you have your full HTML kind of written out in, on the file system, it just essentially serves the file and it's very, very fast. So taking that idea, we, uh, we did it right to the file system, but this publisher in the middle wrote it to a Redis cache. So Redis is a, a NoSQL store that stores key value pairs. So a key was a URL on our website, and then the value of that cache was the full HTML of each article page. And then so requests would, from the public would just hit that Redis cache, so it was very fast. So um, timeline-wise here, so we made our initial commit, then we hired our second Rails engineer in June of 2012, Josh. And Josh came on board, and uh, in like two weeks, he said, eh, I think we should switch to Rails. So why did Josh say that? Um, there were some real pain points with, with Padrino. So uh, the, the ecosystem for libraries uh, was not as strong as Rails. And this is really a Sinatra, also a Sinatra thing, um, because Padrino can use all the Sinatra libraries too, and really any Ruby libraries. Um, it was not to maintain, definitely not as maintained as Rails. Um, the admin system at the time was ugly, although once we moved, actually, I'll do a spoiler, we moved off of Padrino and then they actually, they actually uh, updated the admin system uh, right after we moved, like literally the next day. Um, the community wasn't really as good and what we realized is that in the Rails world, uh, the Rails community itself is actually a very important asset. It's, it's, a, it's a good reason why to, use, to choose Rails as a framework because of the, of the community that's been built around it. And it was much easier to do job posting for Rails developers than it is to say Ruby or Sinatra developers or, or Padrino developers. So we started to the big move. Um, so we were, we, this was a few months into uh, Upworthy. We were, you know, we were a growing startup. Um, so how do we kind of balance uh, moving technically, doing the technical infrastructure with, with the feature work we have to do, with the traffic uh, work we have to do. So uh, in October of 2012, uh, about 10 months after we launched, eight months after we launched, uh, we started the Rails, create a Rails app. And the really great thing about this migration was because we were still using Ruby and we were still using Rack, we could pretty do this in a, in a way that was really kind of didn't really hurt, uh, really kind of didn't make us go offline for really any reason. We didn't have to like stop feature development or anything like that. So we generated a new Rails app, you know, Rails new Upworthy. 
And then we stuck the Padrino app, the entire Padrino app, in the lib directory, and we just called it Upworthy, um, even though we should probably call it another name to be not so confusing. And then we mounted that Padrino app, which was just another rack app in routes.rb. Um, so it was, we essentially took the Padrino app and just kind of put it into the Rails app. Then we uh, went about migration. So we migrate all the models. So we were, use, uh, we were using uh, Mongoid, the MongoDB uh, model uh, framework. So, uh, or, or ORM or ODM. So we migrated those. We migrated our, our plain old Ruby classes, our Ruby, you know, Ruby objects that we built, service objects. Uh, then we did the asset pipeline, moved to the, to the Rails asset pipeline from a kind of, cus, uh, from a, a, I think it was a Sinatra asset gem that we were using previously. And then the last thing we did was, then we migrated the front end, which is uh, the views and controllers into, the, into this big Rails app, um, and then migrated. Uh, so the first was the front end, the, the public website, and then the second was our back end CMS. So we, and then we also changed the CMS from uh, Padrino's admin area HTML CSS to, to use Bootstrap. So it, so this was actually done by one of our um, more uh, from a hire who came maybe later that fall named Ryan, and he actually took about eight months. Uh, and this was because, not because this was the only thing we were working on for eight months, but because we were also building apps, uh, we were building features at the same time, we were dealing with, with scaling traffic. So we were actually okay with just kind of leaving Padrino code in the Rails app, even though it, was, it wasn't really fully converted to Rails, it still all worked because both Padrino and both Rails are built on top of Rack, and you can use uh, th that to just mount various um, various routes to, to various paths, and some, some routes essentially went to Padrino. So for Rails, we, we then had this monolithic Rails app. Um, so for most of 2013, this is uh, what we had. We did things the standard Rails way, the front end HTML, the dynamic AJAX endpoints, um, the back end CMS were all one large Rails app together. And so we experienced kind of the productivity gains that one, one gets. Um, from when they're, they're using just standard Rails stuff. Um, so at this time, we had we really started getting high traffic. So the, the knock against Rails, of course, is that, or against Ruby, is that it doesn't scale. Um, so how did we come go about scaling the website? So the first thing is we did is we action cached our full content pages. So everything, the most we can cache. So an action cache in Rails is uh, essentially the full HTML or whatever that comes back from a single method in a controller, the action method in the controller. So if we could cache that, we did. And so for our article pages, we could cache those uh, because there were some dynamic elements What we did, we kind of offload all that to Ajax uh, interaction. And so we cached full HTML pages uh, in memcached. Uh, we stored our assets from the asset pipeline on S3 and CloudFront, AWS's technologies for that. And we, we were on uh, Heroku, we actually still aren't, are on Heroku. And so those kind of dynamic Ajax requests that would come in per se, uh, when you're viewing an upward article, there's a recommended content like, hey, read this now. Those kinds of things are dynamically generated based on the, the user, based on the browser. So we did have Ajax requests uh, for that. We would just essentially use Heroku to just scale very high. Um, so we were just using the standard stuff. With Padrino, I was talking about that publisher system before that was kind of home, homegrown, home-baked. Uh, with Rails, we just used standard Rails caching. So then we uh, also moved to Fastly, which was a CDN. So the, the next thing in, in the, in the uh, uh, kind of story of our scaling is we first started using action caching and memcached, which were, uh, you know, kind of dependent on the, the, the Heroku dynos and also the memcached um, server that we, were, that we were using that was a kind of a Heroku plugin. Uh, the next thing we did is we moved everything to the Fastly CDN. So there are, there are several CDNs out there and uh, essentially if you want to scale a site, you really need to put it on a CDN. So 
we moved all our assets, including the HTML pages, to, to Fastly, which is one of the, uh, the top CDNs. It's essentially uh, Varnish, uh, the Varnish server as a, as a service, um, which is one of the, you know, the top uh, open source um, kind of HTTP uh, caching servers out there. They put Varnish servers all around the world, and that's what Fastly is. Uh, so then we turn off the Rails action caching and instead use uh, Rails' ability to set cache headers. So Fastly has some special cache headers that you have to set with each controller. So knowing how to do that, knowing why, uh, you know, setting headers is a very low-level HTTP thing, but we it's definitely needed for scaling because you have to be able to set cache headers correctly and know when to expire them and, and how to expire them in the right way so that you don't have weird caching problems in your app, like things don't get stale or things don't go away without, uh, things don't expire from the cache without you expecting it. And then at this point, we didn't need so many Heroku dynos because most of the things that the public was hitting was actually coming from Fastly, uh, and we only needed to serve some of those dynamic AJAX requests to do things like recommended content on the website, to do some A-B testing things we did. So I would, we, we really like Fastly, and you know, there's also um, AWS's CloudFront, which is good, or there's also Cloudflare. Those are all great. So if you really, if you have these issues of scaling, um, don't really worry about your, you know, don't uh, really think about like, oh, Ruby is slow or Ruby doesn't scale. You can really just think about offloading that work to CDNs. So moving to Fastly was also huge for mobile performance, which we are totally realized until we really saw it. Because um, in a mobile web world where most of most of upworthy traffic comes from mobile, um, the reality is when you have a CDN which has points all around the country, all around the globe, it actually returns your HTML, CSS, JavaScript much faster to phones, especially. Um, than a, a Wi-Fi enabled computer because honestly on a Wi-Fi enabled computer they're very fast, they have fast internet, you don't, you don't really notice that those things, uh, you don't notice the, the latency. But when you're on a mobile phone, uh, those, you know, to, to hit a single, uh, if you make a request and your, your Rails app is hosted on Heroku and you live in California, um, that has to go all the way from you know, that request goes all the way to, to Northern Virginia where Heroku's, most of Heroku's servers are, are maintained. Um, so that just takes a while. Um, and that latency is very obvious on mobile. Whereas when you do put things on a CDN, all that stuff is very is located close to you. Uh, one of the great things about Fastly is we w once we moved on it, onto Fastly, which was about two years ago, our public site has never been down, um, which, is, which is really great. So we've... We've, probably, we've experienced maybe some of the AJAX requests have some uh, instability, but that's no big deal because our, our public HTML, every, every single time anyone wants to view an Upworthy article, they will always be able to view it. And that's really thanks to this, the CDN. So we were on this monorail, this monolithic Rails app, and there were um, some pain points. So the first is that we had just one giant Rails app, and it was a giant Rails app that had both uh, front-end stuff serving to the public, and then back-end stuff, the CMS that our writers were using. So traffic spikes on our public page, uh, our public articles, could really make the CMS features unusable because the, the CMS uh, features are very, there's no caching there, they're very database heavy, they make a lot of database requests, so they make a lot of Ruby objects um, to view, you know, to view data. So the code base became very large. We had kind of God objects, uh, especially our article, our article class in, in Rails was, was getting very large. So at this point, we decided to do the breakup. And this was uh, in probably December of 2013. So that's about a year after we actually started the, the Rails app, we did a split. And the split was, um, we decided to do in two two steps, uh, or sh I should say two apps. So the first, so we decided that we should split into the public website that everyone sees. So that's dub dub dub, and then we have a backend CMS, and that's going to be our second app. So what we did is we took our main upworthy monorail, 
Uh, we, uh, we then create two separate Git repositories so that the whole history of those repositories would be maintained. And we called one www, we called one CMS. Then we took, looked at all the controllers um, and views as and assets, things like that, and those clearly went to one or the other. Then uh, we deploy each app to their own Heroku instances. Um, and then Fastly, our CDN, was then pointed to this new Heroku app called www, which we just switched the configuration for, and it was instantaneous, so we had no downtime. And there was then the question about the models, the shared models that both apps would need. And so we created this core gem, um, which did consist mostly of the models and, and some service objects and to try to keep the code as dry as possible. We did not want to have to, when we updated, let's say, the article model, we did not have to update it in two places. We just wanted to update it in one place. So here was kind of the architecture, and with this, we had two completely distinct apps. So the www app, and this was still on Heroku, so www was on the larger PX dynos uh, on Heroku, so the larger performance dynos, because it was getting you know, more, more traffic. Um, and then the CMS was just more on, on the standard, I think, 2x dynos on Heroku, cheaper. And between them, there was that core gem. It was a Ruby gem. It was a private Ruby gem we used a service called Gem Fury to host the gem, and it uh, it just lets you kind of have uh, kind of specify. It well it keeps gems private, so it's not like GitHub, uh, a, an open project on GitHub, and it also just lets you kind of specify URL to to how to get that your private gem. So there were definitely some benefits here um, that we that we saw. So the first one is that instability of one app didn't affect the other app really. Or maybe they, they still share the same database, um, but we, we were able to just kind of keep database queries uh, in check. Uh, because the apps have uh, different scaling needs, we actually were able to do auto scaling. So we created an auto scaling tool uh, based on CPU usage to auto scale the Heroku dynos if, if especially the, the public www app uh, gets more traffic, we, it just kind of scales automatically, adds another dyno, and then removes a dyno when the CPU usage goes down. And also, teamwork was actually divided more naturally. So we were kind of stepping over each other less uh, than we were on the monorail because a lot of features um, you know, were either just for the CMS or were just for the public site. Um, so it was, it was good. It was nice not to have to uh, kind of step, step over each other there and have merge conflicts and things like that. So there were some pain points. Um, the first, since we had two apps, we actually, if there was a feature that touched both apps, we'd have to run them, in, both of them in development on our computers. Uh, if we were doing development instances, because we have some uh, like QA instances, we had to run both. We had to run two instances. Um, also commits, if it's a feature that touches all three, three code bases, the, the two Rails apps, the, the front end and the back end, and the Ruby gem, the, the shared core gem, if there was one feature uh, to kind of that required us to touch all of those, then we'd have like a lot of commits across the code base, which could be confusing. Um, we couldn't run all the specs together, so we just have to make sure all the specs were always running. And sometimes, you know, you can make a change to the core gem that would affect, uh, for, for let's say the, the CMS, but then it would actually also affect the www app, and you might not realize that if you're not testing everything all the time. We also had to coordinate uh, the versioning of the shared core gem because it was essentially like a, this weirdly internal open source project where uh, the, the version numbers had to be consistent and not trip over each other because it was very real, a very real, it happened all the time where let's say uh, the core gem was on version 2.3 and um, there are two people on the team and they're working on the core gem at the same time but the totally different features, they both increment it so let's say 2.3.1 or something, and they don't know that each other incremented to the same version. Um, so that was a bit uh, of a headache to, to, to manage. Same thing about coordinating deploys. So when you had a, a deployment, you, you needed to coordinate, uh, you needed to deploy to both at the same time, and also dependencies. So both, there were two Rails apps, um, and they each had their own gem file, but what could happened is, and also the core, 
gem had its own gem file, what could happen is various libraries we were, we were using could actually be incremented in different ways, and that would create inconsistencies. So these are actually all internal problems um, with our developer experience. They really weren't, let's say, you know, about scaling or anything like that. And so what we really wanted was we wanted to keep a separately deployed app so we could scale uh, the two apps differently and, and have stability there. We actually like the ease of development of a single code base, um, and we also wanted it to also separate concerns cleanly. So in the last few months, we've actually been looking at another solution uh, of Rails engines. So a Rails engine um, has uh, essentially is a, is a sub app, which is very close to the Padrino idea I was talking about earlier, or Django's idea of apps, um, where there's a single container code base, and then you mount each Rails engine inside that code base. So for example, uh, in the Rails world, Devise is a Rails engine. Um, Rails Admin is, is a Rails engine. So those can be mounted inside uh, your app just in the routes RB file. You have uh, your shared models or other classes in that larger container app. And um, it kind of works well. So we actually, uh, we TaskRabbit did this almost exact same thing about a year before we started when we were just starting to research it, they did this last year. Um, so if you go to that GitHub page, they, they kind of explain in great detail all the pros and cons of engines and how you, you might want to use them in your Rails apps. So this big merge um, from, we, we had a split, we had a breakup, now we're, we're coming back together. I was led by uh, two, new, two newer engineers on our team, April and Mark. And they uh, essentially did the following, which is, they created this container Rails app, and we called it Umbrella. You could call it container, whatever. And then, then we had our two existing um, apps, www, and that should say CMS. Um, and the gem, that shared gem, um, actually also became its own engine. Um, so first we put, we translate everything into their own code bases uh, in their own repositories, two engines. And then we copied over those engines to the Umbrella, the new Umbrella container using git subtrees to, again, try to um, maintain that version history. And then in the Umbrella app, we combine asset building and the specs. So now our architecture looks like this, which actually doesn't look too different from the original Padrino architecture. So we have this container app. Um, and then this is just of, of the file systems. We have engines slash www as a, a Rails, uh, the, the, the front end engine, and then we have engine slash CMS as the back end engine. And then in the Rails app folder, we're moving all of the shared stuff into there. So instead of that shared gem, they're just all going to app slash models or app slash services, uh, whatever, or mailers, whatever uh, we use there. So the benefits. Um, so we have the single code base. Uh, there's no more shared gem to manage. There's no more tripping over each other when, when doing versioning for that. We maintain that each engine still runs in its own app in production. Um, but the cool thing about engines, you can mount them any way you want and on any path. So in development, we've actually made a configuration where we just start up that one Rails app, that one uh, app called Umbrella. And on the root, on the slash, the root, uh, root route, uh, we mount the public www engine. And then we do slash CMS. And that actually mounts the entire CMS engine. So we, we run in development one app, uh, but uh, it's two engines. So that's great in development. We only have to start up one thing. Even for uh, QA, if we do a QA instance, we can do the same thing. But then when we need in production to run them separately, we can with engines. So um, also when a small feature that involves both, both apps gets built, it can be expressed as a single commit or a single pull request really. Um, instead of three separate commands or three separate pull requests amongst all our different, uh, the two different apps we had and the, and, the, and the gem we had. So this also means that, that specs can all be run at once. Um, so it's a really nice system. Uh, we, we've actually just started using it in the past month or so. And so here is a little um, kind of timeline of where we're at now. So you can see that over time, uh, you know, we when we started Upworthy, we kind of made these changes 
more closely together in time. And as we've grown, as, as the company has grown, um, we have uh, expanded the time it takes between like these, these various large scale uh, architectural reorganizing that we've done. Uh, so we are at a JavaScript conference. So I'll just do a little bit about uh, how our JavaScript has been. So when we started in 2012, we were just used jQuery, what I call spaghetti code. So just really uh, jQuery that just reached into the DOM and changed things and um, did all that kind of in an ad hoc way. Uh, we had an engineer come on board in 2013. He's more of a systems and, and analytics uh, engineer, but uh, he then kind of led the charge on, on getting us more organized. So we, we started using common JS modules where we were putting function, uh, you know, the various functions within modules. Then the next year we got even more functional. Uh, we used Lodash to, to really take care of, which is kind of like underscore, to really kind of use its functional style of programming as much as we could. We also use BaconJS, which is a functional streaming, like stream uh, framework, uh, or library, I should say. So uh, we use Bacon to do things like listen for streaming events from the web browser. So we, we do something called, uh, we track attention minutes on Upworthy, so we, which are really actually attention seconds. So if you're on Upworthy and you're scrolling around and you're active, where every five seconds we're kind of tracking that you're still active on our page. Um, and so we use Bacon to manage all those events that are coming in and, and kind of um, uh, take this, this stream of data and then kind of uh, compress it into uh, a, a more succinct package and then uh, send that off in an AJAX request. And this year we have started to Reactify a lot of our code base. So the great thing about React, and I know there's a session, another track um, on React today and tomorrow, is that you can kind of take, you can start to Reactify various parts of your JavaScript code base and you don't have to reactify the rest. It's a very um, componentized way of adding more organization to your, to your JavaScript code. Um, it's nicer than J, uh, spaghetti jQuery, definitely. And we like it enough that we're moving towards that for everything. So some lesson learned. Um, the first is that a lot of these architectural uh, projects were identified by new folks on the team. So they can kind of identify the pain points uh, without having really any emotional attachment to, to any decisions that were previously made. Uh, we waited until we could really see negatives to the various architectures we've chosen um, to really make those changes. And because we're still, you know, we throughout all these almost four years now, we've, we've been a, a growing company, we've had to deal with uh, more traffic, we've had to deal with a lot of new features. Uh, it really take, it's really good to just kind of make deliberate decisions um, that are informed by real real world pains. It's, it's okay to take a long time to migrate to the bare solution, especially when, think, thankfully, because of kind of the way Rails and Sinatra and, and Rack are architected, we can kind of just put things, uh, previous things in this certain place and not touch it for a while work on features, and then come back to it and revisit and, and kind of refactor it to be more correct. From a scaling standpoint, um, you really uh, need to think about the CDN and, and just remember that, um, like I said before, even though we, we're, you know, there's the, the world of Ruby frameworks and Node frameworks, um, at the end, our, our apps are just serving HTML, CSS, JavaScript to our browsers, and it's all just HTTP. So uh, with that, uh, we have a few minutes. Um, I think the next session is at 11, and it's uh, 1047 so, or 1048, so I'll have two minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. 
So the question, uh, just to repeat for the microphone, was uh, in the, when moving from the monolith to two different apps, did we have any uh, problems with the testing suite? So, um, no, I mean, we, we divided the tests as were, were, as made sense, essentially. And what we never did is we never made this, like, one script that would run all the tests at the time. And we, we probably should have even made a CI server do that. Um, in retrospect, uh, that I think that's that would have helped us catch a lot of things where if, if something was changed in the core gem and it was meant just for the CMS, it would maybe break something on the public site and we just would not catch that because we were not running all the specs. So I think takeaway for us there was maybe make it easy to do it locally as a developer, like write some script that will run all, all the specs at the same time for each for all the code bases, or failing that, do that in the CI server, um, where obviously you know it's all automated and developers don't have to be bothered with it. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, you mentioned doing some of the components in React. Uh huh. I'm curious, how did you handle the baseball transition? Because I understand that React is really a library. Sure. So the question is about uh, data transmission in using React components. So we still use jQuery's Ajax, you know, uh, dollar sign dot Ajax uh, function for that, and we just we literally put that inside the React component. So like, on so with the React, whenever like various things happen, like when the component uh, renders, it's like component did mount, or there's various other events that happen. You just you just stick those calls into that function. Yep. Yeah. So um, it was a very slight cost of, uh, because it was very slight in uh, cost because essentially the, where we need to scale is really just in one app, which is the the public dub 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 app. So that costs money. Still costs us money. Fastly, you know, is not cheap, um, but it's definitely worth it for the stability. Um, whereas our backend CMS, it's really used just by a few dozen people every day, so it's just kind of a standard internal business application. Okay, it's uh, ten fifty. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming out, um, and you can see me if you have any more questions.